Welcome to Little Cities Week. Uh, we have not let the COVID crisis keep us down. Uh, and as October approaches, our annual Little Cities of Black Diamonds Day date shows up on the calendar. But because of COVID, we've decided this year to uh, go online and do a virtual Little Cities Week instead of uh, um, uh, day. And it's a Little Cities Fest, we're calling it. Uh, our theme for the Little Cities of Black Diamonds this year is uh, roaring into the 20s, looking at the 1920s in the Little Cities of Black Diamonds region and uh, in the greater world. And there are great stories to be told about that era here in uh, southeastern Ohio as well as across the country. Tune in every evening this week at 7 p.m. for really engaging programs and we'd really enjoy your support of our sponsors who will show up in these uh, programs as well as your contributions at www.lcbdohio.org. Thank you and enjoy the show. the distillery about three years ago and uh, we have our students help pick the pawpaws. We make a pawpaw moonshine. Uh, we're growing our own buddy butcher corn and so the students uh, grow the corn and then we ferment the corn and then we distill it. So we have a, um, a buddy butcher moonshine, we have a pawpaw moonshine and then we make a rum, a coffee liqueur and a, um, a apple pie. I know a little bit about the history of this building. This was built by Johnny Richards. He had a store here in the early days of New Strangeville, and in 1923, the building burnt down, and he immediately reconstructed it, this time uh, as a, with brick. Um, there's a lot of features in here that have a bit of a mystery, and since he opened back up during Prohibition, one of the questions is about the function of the upstairs room, which some of the workers were never allowed to go into. And there's a speaker phone up there, not a phone really, a speaker tube, that we don't know where it goes, and a doorway that leads to another building, and we don't know why it's there. General rule is they believe there may have been a speakeasy, but we don't know. That's one of the mysteries. But Eric, you've taken over this building. Have you found any features you'd like to talk about? So, um, this store sold everything from underwear to dynamite. They had uh, glass or uh, gas lights, um, you know, th that were supplying the illumination for this building and selling, um, you know, the um, blasting caps and uh, the. Um, so today we have electric lights, uh, but we don't have any dynamite or plastic caps. <laughs> and, uh, the, um, the store had um, uh, a big safe in the back, and uh, when the college got it, it was still filled with the boxes that the plastic caps came in, and the newspaper from the 1950s, and um, it was just um, uh, deteriorating away, getting very moldy, and uh, we cleaned it out and repainted the safe, and now we use it as storage. The, um, we have a uh, tours during the festival, and some people said, oh, that was my favorite part, I was looking in that safe, but um, uh, it, the, the air quality was improved when we cleaned out the safe. I believe the place smells better now. <laughs> a small town celebrating its big history. 
New Straitsville in Perry County is celebrating the 49th annual Moonshine Festival. New Straitsville was once the moonshine capital of the world, and they dedicated a festival to celebrate the history and making of moonshine in the area. The five-day event, which runs every, every May, has a variety of entertainment such as pageants and music, also featuring carnival rides, a car show, and lots of refreshments for the community to enjoy. In 1970, the village had a centennial celebration, and it went over real big, and since the village was known as the moonshine capital of the world, we decided to have a moonshine festival over Memorial Day weekend every year. People were able to get in touch with their history by viewing how old-fashioned moonshine was once brewed and demonstrate the process to festival goers. You put your sugar in here, you put your cracked corn, and you put your yeast and you let it ferment. Once that's done, okay, once the fermentation process is ended, you strain it. You see, this is not bubbling, this should be bubbling. This is already finished, okay, this is ready to cook. We take this here, and it's placed in a cooker pot. It's copper, still pot. We have the heat source here in the back. You light this and you let it cook. Okay? And once it cooks, it turns into steam, and the steam's forced up through the cap to these copper lines, which is called a worm. The worms coil down into this cooler barrel, it's full of water. And when it works its way down to the bottom, it turns into what we call the moonshine. This is a story about a place you ought to know. Situated in the hills of Ohio Right down close to the Perry Hawking line Where everybody goes a local from a drinking moonshine A drinking moonshine, a drinking moonshine You get a pint bottle for a dollar and a dime When I'm gone, put me on the of town of New College honors the history of this area by uh, making our moonshine product here, having our students go out, take the pawpaws, grow the corn, and ferment the fermentables, distill what's fermented, and make a, a fine product. New Straitsville special was called that because it was a good, safe liquor, not made in an equipment that could poison you. Like in some of the bigger cities, some of the stuff was a little iffy. Um, so, and it was also sometimes called New Straitsville Red because they colored it with a little bit of a bag of wood chips to kind of make the uh, whiskey look more like a natural aged color. Um, so that was part of it. The town had a history of making moonshine already and Prohibition just gave them an opportunity to make money. Uh, the mines were down, the fires had been burning, and with all the places to hide it, which we went over, the people started making it more and more. To the point where if there was a, a raid in the area, to, then most of the stills that were raided would be in the Straitsville area. But there were some people who got away with it for years. And the people who did get away with it and managed, they brought money into the community. The store owners sold extra sugar, extra corn, uh, the products that they needed to help hasten up, you know, to hasten the making of the moonshine. Um, so it was bringing and keeping the community stable. Um, the carpenters got work for making cabinets or boats to get back into the mines because the mines were one of the places. A lot of the houses had hidden rooms, hidden cupboards, hidden places in the wall, and that required a certain amount of skill and wood to make. So the benefits went all through the community. We don't know how far distribution really went as far as verifying it. We have had stories of people having heard of New Straitsville. In World War II in particular, a soldier would run into someone, and there's a story that they really like, where he said, this guy said, well, where, where are you from? And he said, Ohio. And he said, well, where at? And he said, 
well, do you know where Columbus is? And he said, no, is it anywhere near New Straitsville? So he didn't know the capital, but everybody had heard of New Straitsville. So there were people that would run into you from other states that had heard about it. Um, I have, I've heard stories about delivering it to Columbus, to other large cities, even Chicago. And I actually had two interesting verifications of that. One was a woman who said that when her husband came home from the military, he stopped at a bar in Chicago to wait for his next train south. And the guy told him, that he was sitting with said, where are you from? And he said, Carbon Hill. And he said, that's near New Straits, though, is it? And he said, yeah. And he said, how do you know these places? He said, I used to go down there every two weeks on a run to get moonshine. And he said, no, you didn't. And he, the man then proceeded to list every route and road he took to get to New Straitsville. And he said, okay, I guess you have been there. A lot of the old families, they've been making it for years. And they may still know the recipe. Uh, certainly, um, you know, the, the early settlers in New Straitsville were Scots and Irish and Welsh and English. And those are all people that, uh, especially, you know, the, the first three who are really good at sort of evading the law and they don't like paying taxes. So even before prohibition, there were people making shine. And afterwards, uh, you, know, you know it's called shine because they do it at night secretly, right? You didn't know, no, you didn't know that it's moonshine because that's how you have to work. Uh, at least that's the story. And it makes about as much sense as anything as to how it got its name. But there, yeah, there are places around here. Heck, I, I can't think of a place that I could walk to in New Straitsville that wouldn't go past a site that I've been told that there was a still. I mean, even at the end of my own driveway, I've been told that right up on the hill above it, uh, up by this little, uh, it's a little swampy valley that there was one up in there. I've been told that there was one up, the, up on the grounds above Robinson's Cave, up in the trees. I lived in Santoy. There was a still out there right across from the property I owned. And a guy who was a, a school child at the time said they used to, the shiner used to call him and come down and tell him to come down and get warm by the fire when they were walking to school. Cause it was a good mile or two to school so they go down and get warm there. So I just can't think of a place that you wouldn't pass something to do with the history. I mean, you know, I just, I really can't think of anywhere that you would. And everybody's family had some connection. They either made it or distributed it or drank it, one or the other. <laughs>